You look like a human being. You're a humanoid. Why in the world would life forms on Krypton, your planet, evolve into humanoids? Well, on, on Krypton, how long did it take for life forms to evolve into humanoids? Eight billion years! Wow! That's twice as long as it took on Earth. Earth. On Earth, it only took four billion years. I guess Earth is better than Krypton. Let's talk a little about the history of the debate, the scientific debate, about the, the prevalence of intelligence or humanoids. So in the year 1964, in the journal Science, George Gaylord Simpson, G.G. Simpson, there are his dates, he loves South America, he wrote an article called The Non-Prevalence of Humanoids, in which he, he said, we can learn more about life from terrestrial forms than we can from hypothetical extraterrestrial forms. In other words, Simpson rubbished the nascent science of exobiology, which concerned itself with life on places other than Earth, as a science without a subject. You have no subject. How can it be a science? Exobiology is not a science. Well, a few years later, in 1972, there was a symposium at Boston University organized by Carl Sagan and Philip Morrison and George Wald. And if you want to have a look at it, there's the link. And excerpts from this symposium were put into a video called Who is Out There with Orson Welles in 1973. There's the link there. Now, I want to talk about two communities. Carl Sagan represents astronomers or planetary scientists, people trained in physics. And then there's Ernst Mayer. He's a biologist and ornithologist. He knows everything there is to know about birds and evolution. So here's somebody that's a physical scientist. Here is a uh, biologist. So what do these two know about intelligent aliens? Well, in 1966, Carl Sagan co-authored this book, Intelligent Life in the Universe. And then uh, in 1993, Ernst Mayer wrote this article in Science, Search for Intelligence. And he also, 1994, does it pay to acquire high intelligence? And then the next year, these two guys got into a debate. So what it, it's what I call the great Are We Alone debate in 1995. Carl Sagan, the physicist, versus Ernst Mayer, the biologist. And it's, it was titled The Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, Scientific Quest, or hopeful folly. So, the first article in this debate was the improbability of success. Carl Sagan wrote, the abundance of life-bearing planets. Ernst Mayer responded. Carl Sagan responded. Ernst Mayer responded again. Carl Sagan responded again. So it went back and forth and back and forth, and that made it valuable. These guys were interested in the topic, and they knew a lot about their respective fields. So what did Carl Sagan say? He said, when we're talking about extraterrestrial intelligence, we are not talking, despite Star Trek, of humans or humanoids. We are talking about the functional equivalent of humans. I'll say it again. The functional equivalent of humans. Say, any creature able to build and operate radio telescopes. But Carl, 99.99% .99 of humans are not able to build and operate radio telescopes. As, uh, and so they are not the functional equivalent of humans. We have humans who are not the functional equivalent of humans. Doesn't make much sense. Humans weren't able to build and operate radio telescopes until 1932. So no human on the planet was the functional equivalent of humans until Carl Jansky built the first radio telescope in 1932. And here's a picture of him. By building this and operating this radio telescope, Carl Jansky, there he is, became the first functional equivalent human. This is not just a joke, because any definition of functional equivalent human will be problematic. Try it at home. But what does functional, uh, functionally equivalent mean? If on Earth, among all our closest relatives, there are no functionally equivalent humans, why should we expect them elsewhere? On other planets, should we expect the functional equivalent of African elephants and daffodils and naked mole rats, all the species on Earth? 
Why would we expect only the functional equivalent of our own species to be duplicated? And why did, what did Sagan mean by functional equivalent of humans? Presumably, Sagan does not consider our closest cousins on Earth, the two species of chimps, to be the functional equivalent of humans. But why do Sagan and many humans think that our functionally closest relatives will have evolved on another planet, not on Earth? So what do they think happened to our lineage six million years ago when we diverged from the lineage that led to chimps to make us supposedly so functionally distinct? Well, here's one explanation. Carl Arthur C. Clarke's explanation in the movie 2001 for the functional distinctness of humans. Uh, I don't know, three million years ago, four million years ago, our ancestors touched an obelisk that was sent there by aliens, and then, boop, they threw up a bone and became a spaceship. They touched the obelisk. But let's try to understand how we should think about this. Let's suppose that there's a giant set called life in the universe. And let's suppose that life on Earth is a subset of that. Not a problem so far. And let's suppose also that humans are a subset of life on Earth. Not a problem. And also that our closest relatives, genetically, morphologically, and cognitively, are here on Earth, and that's where they are, close to us in the phylogenetic tree. But what Carl Sagan and some others would have us believe, that there is a set over here, this yellow set of, func of functionally equivalent of humans that has evolved somewhere else. And so humans have our closest relatives over here, not over here. These things are, I guess, Vulcans and Klingons and all the other Hollywood humanoids belong to that subset of uh, intelligent life in the universe. But lots of movies, but there's no evidence that such a group exists. Carl Sagan addressed this issue a little bit more detail. He said, we are not requiring that they follow the particular route that led to the evolution of humans. There may be many different evolutionary paths, each unlikely, but the sum of the number of pathways to intelligence may nevertheless be quite substantial. So here you see thinking, here's the stupid things and here's smart things and here are all the different pathways to get from stupid to smart. Many, many pathways he's imagining. Other things being equal, it is better to be smart than to be stupid. And an overall trend towards intelligence can be perceived in the fossil record, so says he. On some worlds, the selection pressure for intelligence may be higher, on others, lower. But here's how Ernst Mayer addressed those statements. Sagan adopts the principle, it is better to be smart than to be stupid. But life on Earth refutes this claim. Among all the forms of life, neither the prokaryotes nor the protists, fungi or plants, has evolved smartness, as it should have if it were better. In the 28 plus phyla of animals, intelligence evolved in only one, the chordates, and doubtfully also in the cephalopods, the octopi. And uh, in the thousands of subdivisions of the chordates, High intelligence developed in only one, the primates, and even there, only in one small subdivision. So much for the putative inevitability of the development of high intelligence because it is better to be smart. Here is the phylogenetic tree that he knows so well. But Sagan responds, Mayer argues that prokaryotes and protista have not evolved smartness. Despite the great respect in which I hold Professor Mayer, I must demur. Prokaryotes and protista are our ancestors. They have evolved smartness along with most of the rest of the gorgeous diversity of life on Earth. But there's a language problem here because, um, well, living prokaryotes and protista are not our ancestors. Mayer knows that. So here's the tree of life. And here's our lineage. Here we are here. So after diverging from our lineage about 3.5 billion years ago, uh, the lineages that led to extant prokaryotes did not produce intelligence. So here's where they diverge from us. These are extant prokaryotes. And, well, actually, there they are. They include the archaea. They did not produce intelligence after diverging from our lineage. And after diverging from our lineage, about a billion years ago, the lineages that led to extant protists did not produce 
intelligence. So here is the, are those, protists, they're eukaryotes, but they did not produce intelligence. So the bottom line is millions of lineages for billions of years did not produce intelligence or high intelligence. That is a lot of evidence for the non-evolution of intelligence. Ernst Meyer sums this up by saying, on Earth, among millions of lineages of organisms and perhaps 50 billion speciation events, only one led to high intelligence. This makes me believe in its utter improbability. Now, Mayer keeps referring to high intelligence, by which he means human-like intelligence, by which he means something that evolved only once. He has taken animal intelligence and divided it into humans and others. Where can you find out more about this interesting debate that took place in 1995? Well, you go look at the Planetary Report here in May and June 1996. And have a look right here. I I encourage you to have a look and read in more detail. You are the functional equivalent of a human. You're living proof that Carl Sagan is right when he says that, that there are many pathways to intelligence. You're not? Why not? Oh, oh, you're the functional equivalent of a superhuman. Excuse me.